That's all he needed was the presence of God. So we had a board meeting the other night. I love board meetings. <sighs> and when the comment was made, you know, like we need to buy our own building, how are we going to raise the millions or whatever it is? And, and I looked at one of the board members and, I, and he said, well, we need money. And I said, why? All I need is faith Amen. and obedience. Faith and obedience will bring what we need. I don't necessarily need to go looking for the money. I need to be listening to God, have faith in what he says, and follow his instructions, and things will come to pass. Yes. So it was an interesting moment. But this is the thing. It's all about timing and recognizing, you know, when God created man, what day was it? Can you remember? Sixth day? So what did man walk into on the seventh day? Rest. So that is a sign for us that God wants us to live from a place of rest. So any time that we are not feeling rest, you're not in God's timing. Now I understand there are seasons, harvest time, and, and sometimes there's periods at work when it's, it's kind of busy. Harvest time in the natural is always... <coughs> A busy time, you've got to get more employees, there's more things to organise, you've got to get the stuff to the market, it's a whole different season. But it's just for a period of time. But if you stay in that pace of grace, if you stay in the rhythm of heaven, then all, everything gets done in God's time. And we are God's creatures, we're his children, members of his household. We have to learn what it is to flow in the timing of the Lord. Too often, we're affected by the world's timing. You retire when you're 65 or 67 or whatever it is now. I don't know what it is. But, you know, there's an age for retirement. There's a, you do this at this age, you know, all these kinds of things. I think it's amazing. I won't say that because it's going to go to air, so I won't say that. But I think it's, <laughs> it's amazing that we won't let children, our, our young people, drink it until they're a certain age and yet we'll allow them to do a whole heap of other things that desecrates their bodies at a certain age, mm. at any age. Mm. I think it's amazing. But anyway, we're not going to go there. But the timing is important. And you were, God created man, he made, and he, man ended into rest. Yeah. So we have to learn to live from rest, even if it's kind of busy in the, in, the, in the workplace, even if it's busy and things have to get done. There is a place of rest. My grandfather never hurried for anybody, like never hurried, much to the disgust of his wife, my grandmother. We lived with them. Dad's parents were out, but I lived with mum's parents. And she was always like, come on, Roy, come on, Roy. And Roy would just, granddad would just take his time. He would never hurry, never be in a rush. And yet she said, and he, he was a boat ride. He made boats for a living. And we lived on the Narang River. He had a beautiful boat that we used to go out on on the weekends. And he, and, but she did say once, my grandmother had a habit of saying things. She said once, other people work in such a rush that at the end of the job, they have to clean up the mess they've made. But your grandfather works methodically and gets things finished in time and everything is done. He never rushed. He worked at his own pace. He knew the pace that he needed to work at. He stayed in that pace. He refused to allow situations, circumstances or other people to push him. Even my grandmother's nagging could not push him. <laughs> but we've got to learn what that pace is for us. Because you're a heavenly being now. You're a member of God's royal household. You're a child of God. So you've got to learn to live in his pace, not in the pace of the world. Now, I understand that, you know, when we work for a company, there's things, that, there's, there's deadlines. Isn't that a horrible name? There's deadlines. There's timelines, all this kind of stuff. But we accomplish that not in the world's time, but in his. Otherwise, we could miss alignments. We could miss things that he set up if we stay in his timing. So we've got to learn to stay in the timing of the Lord. 
and Potiphar aligned himself with God through Joseph. And from that time that he did that, the blessings of God covered Potiphar's household. If you want to turn to Joshua chapter 1. Convergence of time. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it, for then, for then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you will deal wisely and have good success. So dealing prosperously and, and wisely does not come about just by meditation. It comes about when you get a revelation, because it says you'll observe to do. So you get the you meditate to get a revelation, to get the application. And when you actually step out and do the application of that thing, that timing of when you do the revelation, then you make your way prosperous. Then you have good success. There is a timing. There is a timing. And if you go through the book of John, you'll see that Jesus said, my time is not yet. The hour has not yet come. Jesus was, it was very aware of the timing of the Lord. And turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and on. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at the ninth hour, specific time, going to pray, specific time. You know, that was one of the prayer watches. Um, midnight was the biggest prayer meeting of the early church. They had a prayer meeting at 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m., 9 p.m., back to midnight. So every three hours there was a prayer watch. And, and uh, 3 p.m. they would start to pray because there was no electricity or anything. But at 3 p.m. they would start to pray pray that they would end the day wisely and well. 9 p.m. was for reflection. 9 a.m. was for the Holy Ghost and fire. Noon was for death to self and, and, and angelic ministry. So every prayer watch has a particular thing and a particular, uh, particular ways to pray during those prayer watches. And so when you understand what that means, and you can, you can absolutely reboot what's the word, revolutionize your prayer life by recognizing that at this time, this is what happens. At this time, this is what happens. And between 1 and 3 a.m. in the morning is the time when most of the witchcraft stuff is released. So if you are continually being woken up between midnight and 3 a.m., 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, recognize that you are in warfare and that you need to pray appropriately according as led by the Holy Spirit. So it's recognizing the prayer watchers. that they started their day in the evening. I will get to it. <laughs> so timing is so important. Like we really, you know, we just sort of like tend to pray at any time. But there are things that happened in the early church or in the Old Testament at particular prayer watches that really are still relevant to us today. And so in, at, this, at that 9 o'clock they were going up to the temple to pray. And there is a, 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 an alignment, a, a convergence with a cripple. Because at that very time when they were heading to the, uh, to the prayer at 9 o'clock, at 3 in the afternoon, sorry, at the ninth hour, at 3 in the afternoon, a certain man who'd been crippled from his mother's womb was being carried along and laid each day at that gate of the temple called Beautiful that he might beg for charitable gifts from those who entered the temple. So there's a connection and there's a convergence of time between Peter and John and the cripple. And then it says when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, when he saw them, him, something quickened on the inside of him and he, he asked them to give him a gift. Now there were stacks of other people going into the temple at that time but there was something in Peter and John that drew his attention and he asked them for money. See we've got to be aware of what's happening around us. We've got to be aware of what's going on in the realm of the spirit. You've got to be aware of the people that God wants you to connect with and there are times sometimes when you're just drawn to somebody and you don't know why and you don't understand it but there's a drawing because God is wanting 
wanting to accomplish something through that alignment. And so out of all the people going into the temple at three o'clock in the afternoon to pray, and they did that to pray about the closing of the day, that was their time, because they didn't have electricity, you know, when the lamps were lit, that was their, their thing. So when they're going into the temple, he looked up and he saw them and he asked them. He didn't ask other people, he asked them. And he'd been going to that gate every afternoon and he'd been born, he'd been laid that way since his mother's womb. And when he, he asked them to give him a gift and Peter looked at him intently and so did John and said, look at us. Like, look at us. That was a command from the spirit. Look at us. And when he did, he expected, he paid attention to them expecting he was going to get something from them. See, this is a thing that we forget because we've talked about grace, we've got prophetic words coming out of our ears, that faith is a thing of expectation. We expect to receive. When I pray for people for healing, there should be an expectation that when my hands touch their head, they are healed. Not I hope so, not let me bend my back over and see if it works, but the minute we pray, there is that expectation when we touch them. Faith is an expectation and a reception of the power of God. And so this, this man, this beggar, he looked at them expecting and we've, we've forgotten the power of expectation. I am so, I'm trying to think of the word, over. <laughs> Hearing believers say, oh, well, God will, God will fix it. If God will fix it, we need to be in faith at least. For God to fix it, we have to be, I'm not saying that you have to do it by works or anything, but there are certain instructions. Jesus himself only ever did what the Father told him to do. There's an obedience. Yes, I'm in Christ. But there is an obedience that is expected from the sons and the daughters of the Most High to obey the Father's instructions. And so Peter and John looked at him and they said, and again, like Joseph, we've got nothing. We've got nothing. Silver and gold we don't have. But what we do have, we give that to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Then he took hold of the man's right hand with a firm grip and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankle bones became strong and steady. And leaping forth, he stood and began to walk. And he went into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. But Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I've got nothing, but what I do have, I give you. What I do have. Joseph had nothing. He was a slave that was bought in the marketplace and yet Potiphar wanted what he had. This beggar lying at the gate beautiful, seeing Peter and John walking into the temple, I, he wanted what they had. Even though they said, we've got nothing, silver and gold, we've got nothing to give you. Like a beggar is looking for silver and gold, he's looking for coin, he's looking for money. So we don't have anything like that. But what we do have, we give you. So what is it that they had that they could give? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. What else could they give? They gave him a brand new life. Yeah. The power of God. Power of God. What else? Yeah, they imparted faith. Love. Love. Because faith only works by love. Faith never works without love. Healing. Healing. What happened when Potiphar aligned with Joseph, who had nothing? What? He was blessed. He was blessed in, in personally and professionally. There's no limit to what can be received when we give what is in us. Because what we carry on the inside of us is the fullness of God. 
Ephesians 3.19 says that you are a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit.